Good evening and welcome to our program. Welcome to the new year, uh, 2019 with the Word and Sword. This year will begin over 35 years of uh, broadcast on WHKY and uh, we have been with them seven years and uh, it's been a pleasure and we are glad that you've invited us into your home tonight. Uh, many of you have been watching the program for many, many years and we appreciate so much your support and we appreciate so much your uh, your kind comments and your participation in the show from time to time as you call in. And thank you so much for allowing us into your home tonight. I want you to get your Bibles out. We're going to be talking about some things as the new year begins that are very important for all of us to understand and to, to think about. We're going to start a series on, on why we believe or why we do the things we do. And um, do we have to have authority for the things we do? Do we, do we just um, something sounds like a good idea so we do it? Is that how things are done? Or uh, what does the Bible teach about those things? And we're going to be starting on our correspondence course tonight in the first part of the program. We're going to be doing the last lesson of the correspondence course on the, the uh, founding of the church in the Bible. So uh, if you do have, your, have our website, www.wordandsword.com, and spell out the word and, uh, go to that and click on the uh, correspondence course uh, and go there and get the uh, lesson uh, that is there on uh, the church, the establishment of the church. And uh, follow along with us as we go through that, that study tonight. And if you can't do that, then just follow along with us as we'll have slides tonight for that also. We want to thank you again for your time and your, your participation in this program. Uh, this is your program as much as it is ours, and uh, it is a live program, and we hope that you will call in, and that you, if you have a Bible question, you'll call in with that Bible question. Um, a question that is not asked is a question that a person ever remains asking, and so uh, it's something that if you have a question, don't feel embarrassed or wonder whether it's an it's a important question. If it's important to you, it's an important question. And if it's not addressed in the Bible, we'll tell you so. And if it is, we'll uh, try to find that. If we can't find it immediately, we'll give, us, give ourselves some time and get back to you on that, either individually or on the program. We will make sure of that. Uh, there was a question that was asked uh, on our last program about the seven spirits of God from the book of Revelation. And God is... Uh, the symbolic language of the book of Revelation, as we talked about last week, is what has to be understood for us to, to understand that comment. Um, seven is a perfect number. God is complete knowledge. God is complete everything. There is nothing incomplete about God. His spirit is uh, eternal. Uh, God is a, is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in the spirit and in truth. God is a spirit, and it is not God has seven spirits, and we have to pay homage to each one of those. Uh, I'm rather imagine the caller that called in had had in mind something regarding the the uh, menorah uh, from the Jewish religion, where there are uh, seven aspects of God that are talked about, and he thought that maybe that's what John was referring to. That is not what John's referring to in Revelation. He is talking about the completeness. Uh, in the unity of the Godhead, and everything about God is absolutely perfect and uh, complete and nothing lacking. And that is the emphasis in the context of the passage. So we wanted to clarify that uh, as we uh, go into the new year, something left hanging from the last year. So we want to make sure we get that clarified. Get your Bibles out, if you will. Your call operators are standing by right now, and uh, you can call and ask for a copy of this presentation tonight. Or you can ask for a free Bible correspondence course. Again, it's the beginning of the year, a good time to start a Bible study uh, in an organized fashion. The correspondence courses, uh, both, we have two of them that both lend themselves to that. So do call in. Everything we have here on this program is free. Uh, you do not pay us a dime. We don't want any money from you. Please don't send us any money. You can call in and ask for a free tract that is uh, uh, that tract is nothing but a written sermon, and if you have a question about a passage, we can give you as much information as you would like on a Bible passage. 
You can call and ask for a map to our building. You can ask to be added to the quarterly beacon mailing list. Uh, and, and you can also get uh, free biblical study aids at www.wordandsword.com. Our website uh, is currently under construction, so you may have a little bit of difficulty getting there. There are some things that are up that you can access, but call with a Bible, and we apologize for that to a point. It just had gotten to where we had to had to do something with it. It's a pretty big website, so we're having to take it down and uh, redo it a little bit. So be be patient with us and uh, and use the numbers that are there and the other information that's there to, to help you with your Bible study. Tonight, if you will, call with a biblical question or comment, uh, pro or con. You may not like us. Call in and tell us if you don't like us. Uh, let us know that. But be kind, if you will, to our operators and uh, they are our screeners, and they'll make sure that uh, they're kind to you. Uh, you'll receive a book, chapter, and verse answer if you, hopefully, if you'll uh, call in with a question. And again, if we can't get one tonight, we're not going to pretend we know the answer to everything. We will do our best to get that answer back to you. 828-485-5555 is the number. You can also like us on Facebook by going to www.facebook.com slash word and sword or by going to www.facebook.com slash Newton, capital N, Newton, and then capital NC, Church of Christ. And also follow us on Twitter at word and sword. And you can post biblical questions and comments there, and we can access and have a Bible study by those mediums also. Or you can just call us and uh, set up a Bible study in your home. We would be glad to do that. And uh, we invite you to do that if you so wish. Um, it's very important. The main thing with all of this, folks, is to make sure you're studying your Bible. Uh, in the Word, the Bible is the book upon which we'll be judged. So we need to make sure that we are certain as to who we are, what we are, and why we do what we do. Have you ever stopped a question uh, or asked the question, why am I blank? Why am I a Baptist? Or why am I a Mormon? Or why am I a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or Episcopalian? Why am I one of those? Well, you might get varying answers to that. One may say, well, it's my family religion. Well, um, is it the same religion your family entered into to begin with? Or has there been a lot of changes? And also, is, it, is the religion of your family necessarily a valid um, scriptural idea on what you need to be doing? Remember that Judaism was the family religion of the first century Christians, and they left it. They were converted and changed over to Christianity. That had to be hard for them to walk away from that. The book of Acts kind of give, gives an idea about that. But ask yourself those questions, and we'll be going into those things tonight as we go through our program this evening. Now get your Bibles out, and we're going to go to a, a Bible correspondence course. We're going to be talking tonight as we go through the interactive correspondence course that's on our website. And if you would like to get this in printed form, you can uh, go ahead and get with us in, uh, on that. And uh, we can give you that um, in printed form where you can fill those out at your table and have an organized Bible study. Also, we have an organized reading through the Bible program. If you would like for us to um, make that available to you free of charge, you can read through the Bible this year. And um, we have several different ways that you can do that, several different options for you. But call in for one of those, if you would, and uh, to our operators. And uh, the number is down there on the right on the screen. This is the 10th lesson in our Bible Correspondence course. And if you, again, the website is down. So if you uh, would, if you would like to just write us uh, by P.O. Box 893 at Newton, North Carolina, 28658, snail mail and get that to us, or you can go to email at contact at wordandsword.com uh, and go, go with that and we'll see, what, see if we can get you that information. And hopefully we'll have the website up as soon as possible. The church. What is the church? We, hear it, we, we know there's a lot of them, it seems. The term church is the Greek term ekklesia. It simply means called out. It could be used to refer to a group of, uh, any group of called out people for a purpose. But the church is the called out of God. 
It is used in both a universal sense. In Matthew 16 and verse 18, the Lord had, uh, upon this rock I will build my church. And in a, uh, it is used in a local sense in uh, Romans 16 and verse 16. The churches of Christ salute you. So talking there about, a local, about local congregations, the church at Ephesus, the church at Philippi, the church, churches of Galatia, uh, the church at Corinth, that is a local congregation, not the universal church. So we're going to be talking tonight about the, what the Bible says about the church. As you look at the Old Testament, there's not anything said about a church except prophecy about a kingdom. And there are certainly are references to the church, but it is always future. But when we look at the New Testament from the book of Acts on, we find the church in existence in Acts 2 is when that started. So in Matthew chapter 16, in the heart of Christ's personal ministry, he asked his apostles, he took them to Caesarea Philippi, and he asked them a question in Matthew 16 and verse 18 through 20. He said, he looked at the things there and he, he asked people, he said, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some of you say that you, some say that you might be Elijah or one of the prophets. Uh, some think you're John the Baptist, and Jesus asked a searching question. Who are you? Who do you say that I am? That I, the Son of Man, am? Now, two questions. Who do men say that I am, and who do you say that I am? Now, and Peter responded in verse 16 and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, by way of reply, the Lord said, well, upon this rock, I will build my church. He didn't say, I will build my denominations. He said, I will build my church, one, singular. The Lord has one church, biblically. Now, the, as careful students of the Bible, we have to recognize that many times the doctrines of men are at variance with what the Bible teaches. And that's especially true when it comes to, in regard to the establishment of the church. A lot of people today say the church is unimportant, that it's unnecessary, and that it's incidental. In other words, you can be what God wants you to be without any church at all. Now, a lot of the reason people say that is because of what churches have, have done in forsaking their purpose. Uh, there have been many uh, articles written in many denominational um, inner circle manuals recently that have basically called out the churches that are out there in denominations for leaving the, leaving the purpose for which they were supposed to be involved in, in the world. They have gone more toward the social, they have gone more to providing for the, uh, the entertainment aspect. Uh, in religion, and they have gotten away from helping people with the spiritual needs that all of us have. And so what's happened is the philosophy that many people have today is that you don't need a church. Uh, the church is unnecessary. The church is an incidental. But the three great principles that are emphasized in Matthew chapter 16 are that the church is directly connected and rests on the divinity of Christ. Upon this rock, what, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. So they're tied together, directly connected to the, to the uh, divinity of Christ. Also, the church in the Bible was to be built by Christ. It was not built by any man. So there was no man that, built, that was to build the church. And also, the church would be triumphant over all. Uh, notice... The gates of Hades will not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. So Peter was given the, open, the door opening aspect of carrying the gospel first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, and he did that. Well, the institution of the church rests upon the divinity of the Son of God, and it was established by His divine power. And it was so important that death and Hades could not prevail against it. Nothing can prevail against the Lord's church. It will continue. The Lord's church will always continue. 
Now there are several reasons why we need to know the time of the establishment of the church. If you were to look into any um, church's history, you'll find a date for when they started. And you can just go look through this yourself. Hiscock Standard Bible Manual of Denominations is a, and Mead's Handbook of Denominations are, are very good books about uh, and accurate about when different denominations started. So one, one question that you probably ought to ask yourself is when was the church that I'm a member of, when was it started? If it was started, friend, later than 33 AD, roughly, in the first century, then it is not the New Testament church. Because the Lord's church was established on the day of Pentecost in the town of Jerusalem. We need to know the time of the establishment of anything. You know, most of us celebrate our birthdays every year. We want to know what day we were born, and we celebrate that day. Well, people want to know when the church started. When did the church that you're a member of, when did it start? Not when did the local building get built, but when did the denomination that you are a member of, when did it start? So that we, and if it started again after 33 AD, it is not the New Testament church. We need to know the conditions laid down for membership in the Lord's church in the Bible at the time of its establishment. We are talked about in the Bible as being members of the body of Christ and that the church is His body, so we want to know, well, what, what do I need to do to be a member of this body? Ask yourself a question about what do you need to do to be a member of the body where you are? Are you voted in? Does somebody decide, a group of people decide whether you can be a member there or not? Now, from these we need to be able also to determine if members of this heaven-sent institution can be found today. As we read the Bible and we see the New Testament church, we need to look and see if we can find anybody in the world today that's trying to do what they did back then. Is the New Testament church still in existence? Has it been in existence since 33 AD? And the fact is, it has been. Now, look at the, on our correspondence course here, let's go all the way back to the prophecies of Isaiah for just a moment. And let's look and see. Isaiah said in Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. Now turn in your Bibles there if you will. You have that? Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And here Isaiah prophesying about the establishment of the Lord's church says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of of the Lord from Jerusalem. All right? It shall come to pass in the last days. So there's the time frame. We are in the last days right now, the last age, the last, uh, the Christian dispensation. But now he says, For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So we know that it wasn't out of Zion, it was out of Sinai that the law of Moses came. But now we find out of Zion would go forth the law, and the word of the Lord would come forth from Jerusalem. All right. Now we turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and we see that they would be witnesses, or they would be, uh, the word would go uh, into Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. All right, now in the last days when the law goes forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, the Lord's what will be what? The Lord's church will be established. All right? So that's what Isaiah said there in Isaiah 2, verses 2 and 3. We're told here where the Lord's house is going to be established. It's going to be established in the same place the law goes forth, and that's Jerusalem. Now, notice this will take place in the last days, and that gives us the, later, the last dispensation. We are now living in the last days. And again, the Lord is not going to do anything else to save us. He's done everything He's going to do. And He will bring this world to an end when He so sees fit. But now we see here that in Micah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Micah the prophet, prophesying about the Lord's church, says this, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the, mountain of the house of the Lord 
shall be established in the top of the mountains, and the word of the Lord from where? Jerusalem. You see that? So if you go through the prophets and you look and see what are they saying about the kingdom or the church or the establishment of the law and the house of the Lord, what are they saying? Where is it going to happen? Where did the Jew look for that to take place? In Jerusalem. All right? It would take place from Jerusalem. So we notice the Lord's house will be established when the law goes forth. And the law is to go forth from Jerusalem. In the last days, the church of the Lord's house was to be set up in the city of Jerusalem. All right? So the time in the last days, the place, Jerusalem. So we have a time and a place when the Bible, what the Bible says, the church would be established. In the second chapter of the book of Acts, Peter says in verses 16 and 17, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Now that term, this is that, what's happening right then is what Joel had been talking about, the establishment of the church. Now the careful student finds out that the church or the house of the Lord was to be established in the city of Jerusalem in the last days when the Spirit was poured out upon all flesh. All right. Well, the church was not established, friends, by John the Baptist. Nor did Jesus establish the church while He was on this earth. It was not established during His personal ministry. And that's, one, that, that's a confusing thing to a lot of people. When we talk about the church today, people say, well, Jesus didn't go to a church. No, but He talked about the kingdom the whole time He was here, and so did John the Baptist. The kingdom of the Lord. He was going to be, the, he, is going, he is the king right now of His church. He has a kingdom. But Jesus Christ lived and died under the law of Moses. So there was no church on the earth when Christ was here. He was going to establish it in the fullness of time, the Galatian letter tells us. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2, John the Baptist preached that the kingdom was at hand. At hand means close by. Okay? It was going to be close by while he was there. The kingdom's coming, the kingdom's there. Jesus taught the same thing. Well, the church was not established during the reign of John the Baptist, nor in the personal reign, or personal ministry of Christ. Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, notice what it says there. Jesus teaches here that the kingdom was what? At hand. That's Jesus teaching. Jesus taught that. John taught that. Their apostle or their, their followers taught that. And in Matthew 10 and verse 7, the apostles taught that the kingdom was at hand. All right, so here's John the Baptist, here's Jesus, and here's their disciples, and they are all teaching that the kingdom is coming, but it's not there yet. All right, Jesus, when he taught the apostles how to pray, said, Thy kingdom come, not thy kingdom has come. Now we could pray that thy kingdom has come, and we're thankful for the kingdom coming. Well, in Luke chapter 10 and verses 9 through 11, and we'll go back to our charts here, the 70 that were sent out to preach the kingdom of God, and notice it is come nigh unto you. The kingdom of the Lord is nigh or nearby unto you. All right, so that message went out. And then in Matthew 16, 18, what we read earlier, Jesus said upon this rock, the confession that He was the Christ, the Son of the living God, He says, I will build my church. Now friends, look at that for just a moment and ask yourself, if the Lord said He would build His church, how many churches did the Lord build? He built one, didn't He? I will build, and who built it? He would. Where was it going to come from? Jerusalem. And what year would it be? It would be in the last days, and 33 AD would qualify for that. So that's, we find the founder, we find the place, and we find the time, all talked about in the Scriptures. In Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10, Jesus taught the disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Now look at Mark chapter 9 and verse 1 for just a moment, and we'll uh, consider that. If you've got your Bibles, make sure you're there. I got that. Now Jesus says there will be some of you that are standing here who will not taste of death 
until you have seen the kingdom of God come with power. All right? So the time frame follows right there, doesn't it? Jesus says some of you who are here right now will not die until you see the kingdom of God come with power. Now that passage tells us two things. First of all, some of them would not die till they saw the kingdom come. So some of them living right then would see the kingdom come. And then the next thing is that it would come with power. The kingdom was going to come with power. So when the power came, the kingdom came, right? And that fits in with what uh, Peter says in Acts chapter 2. So the power came on the day of Pentecost, and it was in the city of Jerusalem as promised by the prophets. So the church, the kingdom of God, the house of the Lord, was established in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, about the year 33 AD. All right. Now, is that when the church that you go to, is that when it was established? Is Jesus the founder of your church? Well, the fact is, friends, that that's, you'd look it up in any book you want to, at any resource book. All the denominations that exist today, every last one of them, was, just, was started later than this. So that tells us that something happened, doesn't it? Did God plan all of this, that we would all be so divided in religious beliefs? No. God wants everybody to be saved. Did you know that? The fact is everybody won't be saved, but God has provided every means necessary by which all men can be saved. The blood of His Son is sufficient. Now, will everyone do what God says? No, but that's not God's fault. He left us with a free will to decide and choose what we will or will not do. In Luke 22, verse 18, Jesus says, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So again, Luke 19, 11, they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. But that was not the case. The Lord said, no, not yet. In Acts 1 and verse 6, they asked Christ, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Well, what that tells us here in this passage in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, is that there were people that were there, even the apostles, who had a misconception about the church, about the kingdom that the Lord was going to establish. Just like many today have that same misconception. Many today have the, have the false notion that the kingdom is yet to come, and that it's going to be a physical kingdom on this earth, and it is not. My wife and I recently came back from Israel and we were able to see the plains of Megiddo. And as large as they are, and the, the, the territory that's there, that little valley cannot hold all of the armies of the earth for a final battle to take place. It can't hold them. And all of the philosophies and the theories that are out there that point to the establishment of the kingdom yet to come are absolutely without biblical basis, friends. Jesus Christ, the one that I serve, is the King and Lord of His kingdom right now. He's not waiting for His kingdom to come. He's not going to establish it later on. It is here. And He got here about 33 A.D. in the town of Jerusalem according to prophecy. And so we have the kingdom here today. The church or the kingdom was not established in the personal ministry of Christ nor by John the Baptist, but was constantly being spoken of as being in the future. Well, <coughs> pardon me, in Isaiah 2, 2 through 3, the kingdom was to begin and the law was to go forth from Jerusalem, right? That's what we just studied. <coughs> pardon me, I'm getting over a little bit of congestion. I apologize. In Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come in the city of Jerusalem. That's the time frame of Acts 2. Something magnificent is happening in Acts 2. And it's in the time frame of the day of Pentecost in the town of Jerusalem. Now what's happening do you suppose? Well the kingdom's coming. The church is being established. 
Now Jesus prophesied again, remember in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, that the kingdom was to come with power. Now in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles, that's when they had the power. And they was shown by the speaking in tongues that they had. Well, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus said, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in both Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. Now friends, it's interesting as we look at Acts 1 and 2, everything that God has made, and create, all of the things God has created and made, have come about by miraculous means to begin with. And the Holy Spirit was given to the apostles miraculous manifestation of it. When Jesus came into the world, it was by virgin birth. And when the world was created, it was by miracle. God spoke it and it was. And so it is with the church. The Lord brought it in with miraculous gifts and things along those lines. And after those things took, were, were fulfilled, after the purpose for those things was over, there was a natural course that was set up for the church to continue to flow from there. And that is in keeping with everything God has done when something is coming in that is new. In Acts 2 and verse 4, when the Spirit came, the apostles began to do what? To speak with other tongues. Now that's not gibberish, that was, those were languages because it says men from everywhere understood in their own language. And notice this was as the Spirit gave them utterance. They spoke as they were guided by the Spirit to speak. Well, the church of the New Testament, friends, from what we've studied so far, began on the day of Pentecost. That's in Acts 2. It was in the city of Jerusalem where the Spirit came with power in the lifetime of those that Jesus addressed in Mark 9-1. So the church could not have been established after the day of Pentecost. For in Acts 2 and verse 47, it says there, And the Lord added to the church daily those that should be saved. So the saved were added to the church by the Lord as they were repenting and being baptized, Acts 2 verse 38. So the way that we enter into this, into this church is we're baptized into this church, into, the, into Christ. All right. Well, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, Notice what it says there, sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. <coughs> I don't know if you have that verse marked in your Bible, but it's a very good passage to mark. To be ready to give an answer why you do what you do to be able to give an answer for why you have a hope and what it, where is your hope? Can you answer those questions? Do you have anything that answers those questions that is biblical? What is your hope built on? Mine's built on Jesus' blood, the blood of Christ. I have a home in heaven waiting for me. The Bible reveals that. And I'm going there. I'm on my way. I'm going to do my best to get there. Everything that God has asked me to do, I'm going to try to comply with that. And after I've done all of that, then the Lord through His grace will still be sufficient for our salvation. Well, we've looked at what the church is and how the church is absolutely essential to us today. And it is not an afterthought of God. It's not something that God came up with, pardon me, on the spur of the moment. This is something that He had planned, the prophets had spoken about, they were very specific about it. They told Him not only, they told not only where it would be established, but when it would be established, and who would establish it. The Lord would establish it. Now friends, Jesus Christ built His church. There's only one of them. Are you a member of the Lord's church? Or are you a member of something that is much later than the Lord's church? Oh, there are churches that carry characteristics of the Lord's church, but they are not the real thing. 
just like as you look at many things today, you can see something that is a pretty good knockoff, but it is not the original. Very good, very good attributes, looks a lot like it, but it's just not the original. And many people that deal in antiques and all, they can spot an original. And you can spot the original church too. And do you know that anywhere you find people doing what God said in the way that God said it for His church, you will find the New Testament church. And you can trace it to the Bible. When they are asking you to take your Bible and find out what you need to know, to study the Scriptures, you're going to find a, a, a church that is following the Lord's pattern. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, the passage that we, that we just read, the term give a defense to everyone who asks you. That term defense there is to give an apologetic or an apology, an answer or a defense for why you do what you do. Truth has a defense to questions and to challenges. We need to know why we do what we do. All of us needs to be able to answer from the Bible why we do what we do. We might ask some questions right now of you. Does the church where you go have instrumental music? And if it does, why? Why do you have it? Does the church where you go teach that baptism is for the remission of sins, not because you already have your sins remitted? Do they teach that you need to be baptized to join the church, but not to be saved? Do they tell you something that, about salvation, that it is just say the sinner's prayer, invite Jesus into your heart, and say the sinner's prayer, and then that's all you have to do? Does the church where you go teach that you're once saved, always saved? And if so, where is the Bible passage that teaches that? Where are the passages? Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you do what you do? Why do you live a moral life? Can you point to scriptures that tell you why you should live a moral life? Why do you not go to church anywhere if you don't go to church anywhere? And is there a scripture that says that would validate why you do what you do? Those are important questions. We need to be able to give a defense for the actions that we take because we have to have authority for what we do. This happens on the job all the time, doesn't it? You may have delegated authority from the boss, but you have to be careful how much, how loose you go with that. If the boss tells you to do something a certain way, you better do it that exact way, right? Now, if he leaves it up to you to get it done, that's up to you. But we understand that in other things. We need to be ready to give an answer to our boss on the job. We all understand that. We answer to somebody. Well, in religious matters, we answer to God, don't we? And we need to be able to give an answer to God and then to every man that asks us why we do what we do. Okay. So let's go into that. We need to prepare ourselves to answer the question of why. Kids ask that question all the time, don't they? Almost to uh, irritation sometimes. Why, 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 why? You know? Well, some why questions are good and some why questions are useless. But the ones that are good, we need to be ready to answer those. So let's go into our study right now about why we do the things that we do in religion. It's a fundamental study. Uh, why do you believe? Why do you believe in God? Why do you practice what you practice? Why, you, why do you not do certain things? Why do you believe, the question may come up, why do we believe it makes a difference? What somebody believes. Do you think it makes a difference what somebody believes in religion? Do you think that it makes any difference whatsoever? Some people don't think it does. Some people think that religion is just left up to you. You decide what course you want to follow and everybody needs to go along with it. You don't have to agree with it, just go along with it. Does it make a difference what a person believes? Well, we know in other areas of our lives that it does. 
But this is a popular concept. Notice these are some of the things that are said oftentimes in this, in this idea uh, that it doesn't really matter what you believe. Look at the doctrine of faith only. There are many people today, and you can come back to the, to the charts if you will, and a popular concept is that faith only, and that's out there, just believe in the Lord. Okay, That's a popular concept. Many people say that's, that's the way that I want to go. I want to just believe in the Lord and that's it. That's it. I don't want to go to church. I'm just going to believe in Jesus because he seemed like he was a pretty good guy. Well, is that the way to salvation? Does the Bible teach that? Well, some people say, well, sincerity is all that matters in religion. Just so I'm sincere, God will understand if I miss it a little bit. And just so I'm sincere, that's all that matters. And then there are those who say it doesn't really make a difference what a person believes. And if it doesn't make, a, make any difference what a person believes, does it really make a difference whether they believe? <coughs> now you'll find differences of thought on that. Some people will say, well, it does make a difference if you believe in God, but it doesn't make a difference what you believe, just so you believe in God. Well. See the confusion that comes from that? There are others who say, well, you know, just go join the church of your choice because churches are a pretty good idea. But go join the church of your choice. Just pick one that, that fits you and just be active in it and be a good person and that's all it'll take. Well, we hear people say, well, one faith is as good as another. I'm not going to judge you. You don't judge me. Can we do, do we have authority to judge? We do. Judge not that you be not judged is followed by, for in whatsoever manner ye judge, therewith shall ye also be judged. He's saying be careful. Don't judge unjust judgments, but you can judge by fruits. One faith is as good as another. Well, some will say, well, you know what? I think that just good moral people Everybody that lives a good moral life is a Christian. Now friends, let me ask you something. Are we just free to pick one of these at will? Does the Bible teach that we can just mix all these up in a basket and one of them comes out that we prefer, or maybe try all these all of our lives? And that'll be okay. Is that what the Bible teaches? If it does, then let's certainly teach that. Let's certainly teach exactly these things. The greatest obstacle in teaching people today is that many people today don't really think that it makes any difference. But if you, th if you think about that and apply that in other matters, you know they don't believe that. It does make a difference what you believe, doesn't it? It does make a difference. Well, the gospel can't get through as long as someone has blocked in their mind that it doesn't make any difference. That there is no absolute. Everything is relative and there are no absolutes. Well, if you don't think it makes any difference, then you're not going to study, are you? Because that's work. And you're going to consider that all religious issues are trivial things that need to just be, that's, that's just fussing. And you're going to get to a point, if it doesn't make any difference, where you just want people to feel comfortable and you want to feel comfortable around them. And then also, if it doesn't make a difference, you can have a church or not have a church and be equally pleasing to God. Perhaps one of the devil's most effective tools, friends, is this philosophy that it does not make any difference what you believe. Notice what happens. The devil takes religious things, good precepts for the most part, and turns them to where they become deceptive. And so people don't study like they should. They don't, they aren't able to give a defense for what they believe. And they go their way. And they are confused in what they believe. Because they're told oftentimes by their preachers, by those in authority, in their churches, by their leaders that it doesn't make any difference what you believe, but they sure want you to believe what they believe, don't they? Now this idea of 
it does make a difference what you believe argues that there is an objective standard. <clears throat> you are not the standard. I'm not the standard for what we do in religion. There is an objective standard, and who, is, who's, who does that? Well, subjective standards are subject to people, emotions, any number of things, circumstances of life, but objective standards are set and stable. Subjective varies from person to person. My idea or the way I feel one day may be different than yours, so therefore I will come up with a different conclusion. The I feel idea. I feel like I need to do this. This is subjective. Can I tell you you don't feel that way? I could. But you see how subjective that is? How do I know how you feel? I don't know how you feel. So if you're basing your whole religion on an I feel idea, or a I think idea, or my family said this, or my preacher says this, or I read a nice book the other day that said this, then those are all going to change when the ne next book comes out, or the next preacher comes in, or the next family member that you prefer, or the, the next thought comes along, or the next feeling comes along. All of that will change and turn over. It's all subject to change. But an objective standard is a fixed standard, and it is the same for everybody. All right? And we understand this in a number of areas. The Word of God is the objective standard for all of us. God wrote it. God is not a respecter of persons. Every last one of us is. But God's not. So the Word of God is the objective standard. All right? So there is a certain truth that we can go to as our authority and measure our behaviors and our beliefs based upon what that says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you look there, and verses thir verse 13, notice what is said about the Bible. 2 Corinthians 4, 13. We have the same spirit of faith. Watch this. According as it is written, I believed and therefore I have spoken. We also believe, and therefore we do speak. All right? What does it say about that? It is written. So there is a standard that is written down for us that we can believe and we can speak about it. Well, turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. Notice what it says there. If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God gives him, that God in all things may be glorified through Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Do you see what he says there? What is an oracle of God? An oracle was one that sounded forth a message from a king or someone of importance. The oracles of God would be those that the Word of God is described as the oracles of God. It is God's set standard. Now, look, if you will, also at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37, where the Word of God is talked about as being the commandments of God. Read with me, if you will, if any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now, what Paul's telling them there in, at, at Corinth, he said, I want you to know that the things I'm writing down to you are not my thoughts. It's not something I made up one day. It's not something I dreamed about. These are the commandments of the Lord. And a lot of people make fun of that word commandment and say that's legalistic. But these are the things of God. God had some things He wanted us to know. And He wrote them down for us. And there's not, they're not just out there so we can look at them and say, well, that's a good idea, or I can take or leave that. These are the commandments of the Lord, the oracles of God. They are the written down Word of God. In 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the Word of God, that you heard from us, you did not receive it as the word of men. Now that tells us something.
Paul's telling Thessalonians, the things we wrote to you, they weren't just our ideas. And you didn't receive it that way. You received it as the truth, the Word of God that effectually works in those who believe. So the Word of God is active, it's working, it's powerful in all those that believe it. So God has a standard, doesn't He? It's a very objective standard. And notice the Word of God, how clear it is. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is inspired of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto every good work. All right, so every good work. We are thoroughly furnished unto everything we need. Okay? And all Scripture is inspired of God. And it is profitable. Now the words of the Scripture, and this is a very interesting passage. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <coughs> Pardon me. Verses 9 through 13. Read with me if you will. And I'll try to get through this. I apologize so much for coughing and wheezing. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor has ear heard, neither has entered into the hearts of man the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. God's revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. For man, what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the things of God knows no man, but the Spirit does. Now we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. Which things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but that which the Holy Spirit teaches. Comparing spiritual things to spiritual things. What's Paul saying? I'm telling you what God said. So friends, when you read, and if you're going to be reading through the Bible this year, you're reading the words of God. When you go to your Bible and you open up and you look at a passage, you're reading the words of God. God's talking to you. And it's not in some small, still voice somewhere. It's logical. You can read it. You can understand it. You can discern it. You can rightly divide it. You can know what you need to do to please God. Because God told you. <coughs> and that's the objective standard. And it's not going to change. Good news, it's not going to change. That's why it's called the gospel, the good news of man. So we have a fixed standard. We have a church that was established on the day of Pentecost according to prophecy in the town of Jerusalem in the last days, about 33 AD. And Jesus Christ is the founder. And He gave us a word that we can measure what we're doing. We can look at the Word of God. We can give a defense for what we believe. And we can use the Scriptures as our authority in all things. Objective standard. It makes a difference, friends, what we believe. If God went to all the trouble to send us a message so that we are commanded to believe and study, then do you think it makes a difference with God what you believe? It may not make any difference to man what you believe, but it sure makes a difference to God what you believe. Why would He teach anybody? Why, would he, why did He come into the world to change people if it didn't matter what they believed? It does matter what a person believes. Now let me ask you a question. Look at this chart for just a moment. Let me just leave that there and just, you just read that for just a moment. Go to the chart, please. Does it make any difference how you wire a house? Think about that. I just recently learned how to do receptacles. First thing you do is turn the power off, by the way. Does it make any difference how you wire a house? <clears throat> is there a standard? Do you call your neighbor over or your neighbor's wife and say, would you wire my house for me? Do you let your child wire your house? Do you let your grandma wire your house? Do you let your dog wire your house? No. 
Somebody says, those are silly questions. Yes, they are. But those are the standards that many people use today, aren't they? What my neighbor says, what my wife, what my grandma says, you know, what my children want to do. Those are standards. They're subjective, but they're standards. There is a standard by which a house is supposed to be wired, isn't there? And you're supposed to wire it according to code. You don't wire your house according to code, guess what? You don't pass inspection and you don't get to live in that house until it has been wired properly. You don't wire a house because you've, uh, properly because you feel like it's wired properly or because you think it's wired properly. Or I know an electrician and he says, no, there's a code and it is an objective code and it is written for a purpose and it's code. Somebody says, well, my dad wired his house one time, so I'm going to wire my house. Do you have any credentials? No, I'm just going to do it. My neighbor did his this way. He cut some corners. Well, you start cutting corners and not following the objective code, and you're going to not pass the inspection, friends. And your house, your house, no matter how beautiful it is, will not be able to be lived in because you did not follow the directions. You did not follow code. There's an objective code for how to wire a house. And we all understand this, don't we? We can die if our house isn't wired right. And feelings don't do it. Thinking doesn't do it. Just because somebody else did it this way or my relative did it this way or my neighbor said this is the best way. No. You follow the code. What is the code? Well, there is a national electrical code on how to wire a house. It makes a difference how you wire the house. Not just that you wire it, but that it be wired properly. Okay? So it makes a difference what you believe on those things, but it also makes a difference what we believe when it comes to the Scripture. Did you know there's only one faith that is talked about in the Scripture? The Bible speaks of one faith. It does not speak of many faiths. In Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, there's one body, there's one spirit, as just as you are called and one hope of your calling, there's one Lord, one faith, watch that, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Now friends, that passage has been in the Bible for years, but there's a lot of people who haven't read it, have they? They talk of many faiths. The Bible talks of one faith. One faith. That's it. Well, one faith means only one faith, doesn't it? Now in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, let's read it again. There's one body. There's one spirit. There's one hope. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Watch this. There's one God who is above all, through all, and in you all. All right? One spirit or many spirits? Only one spirit? Yes. One Lord? Can we have many lords? No. When it says one, what does it mean? It means one. Only one Lord. One God? Many gods? Or only one? See the standard? The Bible set the standard, didn't it? So when somebody says you can have a lot of spirits, you can have a lot of lords, and you can have a lot of gods, that goes totally against what this passage says, doesn't it? it violates what God revealed. One faith? Does that mean many faiths? Now notice you can't just jump here and say one faith and then say, well, you, there is just one God and one Lord and one Spirit, but there's many faiths. No, you can't just dissect this that way. That's not honest. That's not an honest way to exegete a passage. Is there only one faith? Or are there many faiths? They both can't be true. Okay? Well, there's no such thing as my faith and your faith or different faiths. Based upon what the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, right? Now let me ask you something. Is it possible for a person to believe a lie and be lost? And even more than that, does the devil want us to believe a lie and be lost? He does. 
And he will take preachers and pulpits and he'll take religions and he'll use that to promote error. It will seem like it's truth, but it is when investigated and when put to the test, it is a lie. And good people, it's possible for good people to believe a lie and be lost. You know, I could believe a lie and be lost. I could be lying to you and you wouldn't know it unless you've checked what I'm saying by the Bible. And we're giving passages, by the way, tonight. hope you're following with them. Is it possible to believe a lie and be lost? Turn to 1 Kings chapter 13 for just a moment. We're going to go into that for just a moment. 1 Kings chapter 13. All right. There was a young prophet that was there. Go ahead to the charts, please, again. Charts, please. There was, a, there was a young prophet in 1 Kings chapter 13. And he was told, don't eat bread, don't drink water, and do not return by the same way that you came. Now that's what the Lord told him. That's what he was told by the Lord. And I'm going to read it. Behold, there was a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord that went to Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar of incense. And he cried against the altar to the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, thus saith the Lord, A child shall be born in the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign the Lord has spoken. All right. It came to pass when Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand and said, Lay hold on him, and his hand which he put out against him dried up. The altar was rent, the ashes poured out, and the king answered and said to the man of God, Entreat now the face of thy Lord, and pray that my hand be restored. And notice what the man of God besought the Lord, the king's hand was restored, and it became as it was before. All right. And so the king is appreciative. He answered and said to the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand might be healed. And the guy did that. So the king says in verse 7, Come home with me. Refresh yourself, and I'll give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, If you give me half your house, I'll not go with you. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For it was charged me by the word of the Lord, and when he said, Eat no bread, drink no water, nor turn again by the same way you came. And so he went the another way, and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. And then the story changes. There was an old prophet in Bethel. And his son came and told him all the works the man of God had done that day in Bethel. A word spoken to the king he told to his prop father. And the father said, What way did he go? For his sons had seen what way the man went. And he said to them, Saddle me my donkey. And they saddled him the donkey, and he rode there. Went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And said, Are you the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, Yes. He said, Come home with me and eat bread. And the man said, I will not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink any water, nor turn again to go by the way you came. But the man said to him, I am a prophet like you are. And an angel told me by the word of the Lord, Bring him back into your house, and he may eat bread and drink water. But the prophet lied. So the older prophet lied to the younger prophet. So the younger prophet went with him and did eat bread and drank wine and drank water. And it came to pass as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man that came from Judah and said, Thus says the Lord, You have disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and has not kept the commandment the Lord told you. But you came back and you ate bread and drank water in the place of which the Lord said, Do not do that. Your carcass shall come into the sepulchre of your fathers. You're going to die. 
So what happened to this young man? He believed a lie, didn't he? Now, why did the old prophet lie to him? I have no idea. But he did. He had credentials. And this young prophet may have thought, well, this older prophet certainly knows. And if he says God talked to him, I guess, well, you know, I'll just listen to him. I'll take what he said. But notice he had heard his commandments directly from the Lord. He knew what the Lord told him. And God does not give false signals. He's not out to trip us up. But this young, this older prophet directly violated what the young prophet had been told. The young man sadly believed it and disobeyed God because he believed a lie. Was the young prophet an ungodly man? Nope. He was honestly wrong. He messed up. He did it with a good conscience. Now turn to the book of Acts and we'll see in Acts chapter 9 and other passages another man who did everything he did with a good conscience. He's the Apostle Paul. His name is Saul in Acts chapter 9. But what happened to him? He was breathing out persecutions and threatenings against the people of God, Christians, and he thought he was right. But he did not understand the old law was over. And that Christ was the, redeem, the Redeemer, the Savior of the world. He honestly believed that he was doing what was right. But he had believed a lie. It wasn't any longer binding. The Old Testament was over. But he believed that he was doing the right thing. Friends, I believe the world is full of people that believe with all they have that they are doing the right thing. You, you are probably a person like that if you're watching this program. But have you ever proven that it's the right thing? Have you ever listened to the Word of God and objectively done that, not sat back and said, well, I'm not going to ever examine what I believe because it's the religion of my family or it's the religion of my grandma or my dad or my, my brother or my wife or whatever. Are you just going to accept that or are you going to see what the Word of the Lord says? Let's listen to what the Word of the Lord says. Because people can lie to you, right? You've got a Bible. You can look at it. You can put the pieces together. And you can be led along that line. We'll be glad to teach you like the, uh, Philip taught the eunuch. But at the end of the day, the decision's yours. To be obedient or disobedient to believe a lie. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 10 through 12, there's a passage there that's very important for us to understand. We can believe a lie and be lost. We can do that. Those that believe a lie will perish, just like this young man did. But they'll perish eternally. You see, what we believe matters. The young prophet believed a lie and he was punished by God, held accountable. No matter what his intention was, he followed a lie. He disobeyed the Lord. Now those that believe a lie in 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 and 12 are deceived. The lie that is told is a deception. Now the people that tell it don't love the truth. This old, this old prophet, he didn't, he didn't love the Lord. He didn't love the truth. People that listen to a lie are deluded. Notice that. It's possible for me to be deluded, isn't it? You ever bought a car and you thought it was a good car and only to get home and say, boy, I was messed up. <laughs> Why didn't I see that? We all have been fooled, haven't we? thinking seriously that we had a good deal. But we've been deluded. Many of us have believed lies because we are trusting. And certainly that person wouldn't lie to me. But many times that happens, doesn't it? People disappoint you. They don't believe the truth. If we believe a lie, we, we are not believing the truth. 
The truth is clear. The facts are there in the scriptures. But many people choose to believe a lie. Paul talks about those that are deluded. They have pleasure in unrighteousness. It's what is comfortable for them. It's what fits them. You hear a lot of people today talk about, I want to find a church family that fits my needs, my felt needs. Well, if it's not scriptural, it's unrighteous. And you can have pleasure in unrighteousness, friends, and you can feel good about it, but it's unrighteous. At the end of the day, if it's not right, it's unright. And that's as clear as it gets. Those that do these things and fall into these deceptions don't love the truth, are deluded, they believe a lie, they're not believing the truth, and they have pleasure in unrighteousness. Verse 10 of 2 Thessalonians 2 says they will perish eternally. Well, let's, let's look. They'll be condemned, verse 12. Notice here in verse 10, it talks about those who love the truth, who believe the truth, verse 12. To those who love the truth and believe the truth and study the truth, what happens to them? Verse 10 says they will be saved, that they might be saved. Why do people believe lies? Well, <laughs> our, our society is riddled with this type of idea, isn't it? The sensational is that which sells newspapers. The sensational is that which gets you to listen closely to your radio. Sensationalism. The lie. The innuendo is believed in our society long before the truth is. No one worries about what is the truth. They just worry about what can sell the most papers or what can get the best ratings. And that's what we believe. We we buy into it. We we talk about it at the water cooler the next day. What's the latest lie that we've been told? What do you know? In religious matters, we can't afford to believe a lie. We have to examine what we believe. And friends, that's why this this program we believe is so important. That we're trying to point you to investigating to looking into what you believe, to being able to give an answer, an apology for what you believe. And if you can't find that in the Scriptures, use the objective standard of Scripture. But find out what you believe and why you believe it. And if you find yourself to be wrong from the Scriptures, change. Stop believing the lie and start believing the truth. It is possible to believe a lie and be lost. Is it possible for a person to be religious and be wrong? Well, notice in Genesis chapter 4 and verses 3 through 5 for just a moment. Going all the way back to the Garden of, the Garden of Eden and Cain and Abel. Cain's offering is just simply said it was not acceptable to God. That's enough for me. Why well, wasn't acceptable to God? I have my ideas, but this says it wasn't acceptable to God. In the process of time it came to pass, Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel brought of the first fruit of the floor and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was angry, and his countenance fell. Now notice both of these bring an offering to God. One is acceptable, one is not. You got that? God accepts one, one sacrifice, but He does not accept the other. Cain's offering was of the fruit of the ground. Abel's offering was of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord respected Abel's offering, and He did not respect Cain's offering. Hebrews 11.4 sheds some light on this because it says that Abel acted by faith. Hebrews 11.4. But Cain did not act by faith. All right. So the authority for what Cain did was not there. He did what he did without authority from God. Abel had authority from God. Hebrews 11.4. All right. 
Let's look at another example, Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, where you have Nadab and Abihu, the sacrifice, but it was a sacrifice that did not please the Lord. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire in it, put incense in it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went from the, out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Are they serving the Lord? Yes. To a point, but they're not doing it right, are they? They're not doing it according to the objective standard of God's Word. Had God told the priests how to offer a sacrifice and where the fire was to come from? He very well had. And they knew that they did not get the fire in the right way. They offered profane fire, unauthorized fire to the Lord. That's what the New International Version says, they offered unauthorized fire. Okay. So here are, are two religious people, Cain and Abel, Nadab and Abihu. Religious, but wrong. And they're just two of the examples. Paul said that he was that way. He was religious. A case could be made that Paul was perhaps one of the most religious people that ever lived. But he was wrong. He says, I thought that I should do many things contrary to the Word of God. I thought, you see that? My thinking, it seemed to me like that what I was doing was the right thing. Friends, there's, a, there's people down at the Newton Church of Christ that thought one time that with everything they had that what they were doing was the right thing. They were in different religions and they were believing things that were not true. They weren't doing that because they were mean people or because they were ungodly people in some way. They were doing that because they just had not bothered to find out why they were who, who they were. They had not checked out and searched the Scriptures daily to see if the things that they were doing were so. When they did that and they found themselves to be in error, you know what they did? They changed. They changed. And the world is full of people just like that today. How did they get that way? They investigated. They looked in the Scripture. They followed the objective standard. They didn't follow their feelings. They didn't follow what, they, what somebody told them. They followed the Scriptures. They were instructed in the Scriptures and they believed it and they changed. And we hope you'll do the same thing. Let's look at some consequences of this idea of believing whatever you want to believe. Well, let's look at some consequences. That means that directly opposite practices and doctrines are equal. Do you know when you talk to somebody that says it doesn't matter what you believe, you don't have to talk long before you realize it does matter to them what you believe? Because they believe what they believe is how you should believe. <laughs> When you talk to somebody that doesn't believe in, in an um, objective standard, for instance, they will tell you that, that you, can't, you can't bind that on other people, but you have to just be a free thinker like I am. It does matter. They want you to believe just like they believe, and they'll try to convince you. So it does matter to them, doesn't it? Why would they even try to convince you? If it doesn't matter what you believe, then what do they care what I believe? See? But they do care, don't they? They do care, and they'll argue with you about that. You know, people that don't, that don't think it matters what you believe in religion will limit it sometimes to, oh, well, in, in the Christian religion. Well, now, wait just a minute. If it doesn't matter what you believe, then does it matter whether you believe or not? Do you need to believe anything? Could you just not believe and that would be all right and you could go to heaven that way? You know that's not true. Well, somebody says, well, you know, I, I, can, I can buy that the Islamic people and the uh, Shinto people, 
and the Zoroastrian people and all those types of things, the Hindus, that they're off base. I can, I can buy that. But now, you know, that's, that's because they're so bizarre. Well, bizarre to who? If it doesn't make any difference what you believe, who's to define what's bizarre? You see, that was one of the confusions of the religious world that the Christians lived in in the first century. They had people saying, and Acts 17 is an example of this, just find your God and worship Him. It doesn't matter what God you believe in. And in the midst of that, Paul stood up and said, yes, it does. It matters. It matters. And we need to be the same today. It matters. Well, if it doesn't matter what we believe in religion, then we can do anything we want in religion, right? And we're seeing that, aren't we? There's no limit as to what some churches will do, you know. There are churches today that are having gay rights uh, meetings. And honestly, and let me speak to that for just a moment. People, we have questions sometimes. People say, well, what does the Bible teach about that? <coughs> well, I'd like, for you, I'd like to read that to you, all right? Turn to Romans chapter 1, and let's look and see what the Lord says about that. In Romans chapter 1, talking about the decadence of the Gentile world, he says here, God gave them over. They, these people, they knew not God. They glorified Him, verse 21, not as God. Neither were they thankful, but became empty in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made by corruptible man with birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So God gave them up to, an un to their uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. They changed the truth of God to a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, which is blessed forever. Amen. And for this cause God gave them over to vile affections. The women changed the natural use into that which is against nature. And the men likewise, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one to one another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was due. And they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them to a reprobate mind to do those things that are not convenient. That's what the Bible says. It's not what the average person says today. But it is what the Bible says. And do you know you'll get in trouble? I may get in trouble for, for reading that passage, just reading it. You may get in trouble for posting that on Facebook. Maybe banned from Facebook for doing that. But it's what the Bible says. And if it doesn't make any difference what you believe, it doesn't make any difference what you do, does it? There are no chains. There are no um, fences. There's no controls. You can just do whatever you want to do. And you see, the fact is, people do think it matters. Okay? The Bible teaches that fornication is sinful. But if it doesn't make any difference what you believe, fornication's okay. Heterosexual or homosexual. You see where this idea of it doesn't matter what you believe ends up? That which proves too much doesn't prove much, does it? Can you do anything you want to in religion? No. And you don't believe that, do you? You believe that there are standards that should be abided by, and those standards are found in God's Word. Most every one of you who is watching tonight, I believe, believes that. Do you practice it? Do you practice that you can believe anything? No. You believe that what you're teaching and what you're doing is right, don't you? And that is the right way. And you want other people to do what you do. Well, again, if we're basing it on feelings or what our family religion and our heritage is, we're, we're, we're not going down the right path. Let's follow what the Scripture says. 
Does it matter whether a person believes or not? Does it make any difference whether a person believes the Bible or not? If it doesn't make any difference what you believe, do you have to believe the Bible? Can you teach two diametrically opposed ideas like evolution and creation? Can both of them be right? And are we to be tolerant of one another in all of those things? Or is there an absolute truth on those things? There's truth. Where is it? It's in the Bible. It's the objective standard. You see? It can't be true that baptism saves you, but then that baptism doesn't save you. Those are, those are two different ideas. But if it doesn't make any difference what you believe, eh, don't worry about it. That's convenient, but it's just not right. And it's not really something anybody practices. Is the Bible important? There have been those who through the years have sought to dismiss this book. There have been attempts to, to try to destroy it totally off the face of the earth. But it's still here, isn't it? And you know what? It can be absent in your life, but it's still going to be the book by which you're judged. We'll all give account for the deeds we've done in the flesh, whether good or bad. Where do we find those things? What we're supposed to do, what we're not supposed to do in the Bible. That's where we find it. Are you following it? Do you know what it says? Do you know who you have believed? And are you persuaded he's able to keep what you've committed to him till that day? Or are you just flying by the seat of your pants in religion? Have no idea that what you're doing is right or wrong. God, what God says, friends, is important. It makes a difference what we believe. Okay? It makes a difference. Now, how does all this apply to me? How does it apply to you and I? Well, let's look at this. I need to know the truth. John 8, 32. If I know the truth, it'll set me free. And there are so many people need to be set free today, aren't there? You may be one of them. You may be getting over hangover even from, from last night and you just feel horrible. And you know that's not the way to live. You need to know the truth. The truth will set you free. A freedom that you have never understood that just baffles your mind if you're a worldly person. But it is the best life in the world, the truthful life, the life of the gospel. It's the best, best life in the world. You will have a freedom in Christ that you have never experienced, in, like nothing you've ever experienced in the world. You'll be able to pillow your head at night with no guilt. You'll be able to pillow your head at night and sleep and not be worried about what's going to happen to you tomorrow. I need to study. You and I need to study and examine what we're taught like they did at Berea. They searched the scriptures daily. Why? To see if what they were being told was true. Oh, that people would do that today and would call those that teach error on their error. You know what happens today if you do that in a church? They're done with you if you question what they ask, what they're doing. But we need to be ready for that. Let God be true and every man a liar. We need to prepare to tell others why we believe what we believe. 1 Peter 3.15, be ready to give an answer to everyone that asks you a reason of the hope that's within you with meekness and fear. Well, why do we believe? Why do we practice what we do? Why, we, why do we not believe? Let's apply this to a specific issue now. Why do we believe that baptism is essential to salvation? Actually, I believe that. Do you believe that? Well, if I tell you I believe that because that's what I was taught, or that's what my church teaches, I've told you the wrong thing. I believe that because it's what the Bible says. That baptism is essential to salvation. Remember, I believe that the Bible matters. I don't fall into the idea that you can just do whatever you want to, and believe whatever you want to. If the Bible matters, friends, and most of the people, most of, the, of the, you who are watching believe the Bible matters, don't you? You think it's the inspired Word of God. 
Well, the, the idea of baptism for remission of sins is much disputed in the religious world today, friends. Some teach that one saved by faith before and without water baptism. And some teach that we must be baptized in water to be saved. And that's what the Bible teaches, by the way. Can both of those be true? Can a person be saved by faith before and without water baptism? Can somebody be saved by being baptized in water for the remission of their sins? Yeah. But those are directly opposites, aren't they? There's been a lot of religious debates on this subject. Many believe in baptism, and they practice it, but they don't believe it's essential to salvation. They'll tell you it's important, that it's something you have to do to be in their church, but they don't believe it's for salvation. Well, that's interesting. The Bible doesn't teach that, does it? Well, let's see what the issue is and what the issue is not. The issue is not whether or not one is saved by faith. Did you know we're saved by faith? Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, you're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And then look at verse 27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's not whether or not somebody is saved by the blood of Christ, friends, for the blood of Christ saves us. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. That's 1 John 1, 7. And the blood of Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So we agree. The Bible teaches. The objective standard says that we are saved by faith and that we're saved by the blood of Christ. The Bible also teaches that we are saved by grace, Ephesians 2, 5. And in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, He has quickened us together with Christ. By grace we are saved. So grace saves us, no doubt about it. It is God's grace that saves us. And that grace has provided a plan by which we are to be obedient and access that grace. The question is not whether or not one is saved by baptism alone, because no one is saved by simply getting wet in water. No one that I know has ever made that argument. Baptism by itself saves no one. It's not whether or not one is saved by the words of merit that they say, okay? Works of merit. In James chapter 2, are we saved by works? Yes. James makes a case for that. And he says it's not faith only, but works are absolutely essential. The works of God, I can't dream up a system of works by which to get to heaven, but God can. And He has, and He gave them to us. It's not whether or not one is saved by water, because we are saved, 1 Peter 3.21, by water. So the Bible teaches all of these things. The objective standard teaches all of those. So the question is, is water baptism essential to salvation? What does the Bible say? When or at what point is one saved by faith? Okay. These are the questions. When or at what point is the blood applied in my life? It's essential for my salvation. It cleanses me from sin. Now, why is it important for us to come to a conclusion? If baptism is essential, then any person that's not baptized in water for the remission of their sins will be lost. That's urgent. That's serious, folks. Those who teach that it's not essential are false teachers. You see the ramifications of that? You can't have it both ways. If baptism is essential for salvation, it's essential for everyone's salvation. If it was essential for you, for you, it's essential for everybody. We even have some Christians that don't seem to think that that's necessary. Seem to make arguments for people that, oh, you know, I can't judge that they're lost just because they hadn't been baptized. No, they're lost because they hadn't obeyed the Lord. And you'd be lost for the same reason, but you obeyed the Lord. You're a Christian, and you're in Christ. So don't make windows for people to jump out of God has not made for them. Okay. The same gospel that convicted your heart is to convict everyone's heart. And people are saved the same ways. They're not saved by different, different ideas and different situations.
Now, if baptism is not essential, then those that teach it, and I'm one of them, are binding where God did not bind. And you owe me a call. Because I'm telling you, I believe water baptism is essential to be saved. And if a person doesn't do it, they'll be lost. Now, I am, ever I am either binding where God didn't bind, which means I am a false teacher. I have the damnation of God resting upon me. Or I am teaching what the truth says. I can't be doing both. Now, which am I? Am I teaching what the Bible says, or am I teaching error? Am I binding something God didn't bind? Please love me enough to tell me if I'm binding where God didn't bind. Call. Call the program now. Well, the question that we have to have is based on upon evidence. In Mark 16 and verse 16, Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be what? Shall be saved. Now here's God in the flesh on the earth, and he's saying, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. All right? That's what Jesus said. You believe what Jesus said? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. Notice the order. Belief and baptism equals what? Salvation, doesn't it? But what does man teach? Believe and you'll be saved, and then you can be baptized if you want to. You know there's manuals and denominations that say it that way? That you are saved at the point of faith, and then you should go be baptized. Well, that's just not found in the Bible, is it? That's not what Jesus said. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Not he that believes and is saved can then be baptized. Now, which one do you believe? Which one of these statements are you willing to rest your eternal destiny on? The one that Jesus said, or the one that a majority of religious people believe? The majority believe the second one. Fact is, it's just not in the Bible. It's not taught there. Now let's look at the parallel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. All right, the parallel, let's just use it with eating food. He that eats and digests, digests his food will be healthy. He'll have all the nutrients, all those things. But the one that doesn't eat will, will be unhealthy. That's the parallel. So what's the point? Why didn't Jesus say, he that, believes not, uh, he that believeth not and is baptized not shall be damned? Because if you don't believe, you're not even going to pursue baptism. So if you don't believe, you won't follow anything else God says. So you'll be condemned. If you never eat, you'll be unhealthy. You'll die. But if you eat and digest properly, then you'll, have, you'll be healthy. Okay? Now let's compare it to buying a car. Suppose Ford Motor Company put out uh, an advertisement said, the person that believes in Ford Motor Company and is baptized in our pool will receive a new, a new Ford free of charge. <coughs> would you go down? Some people that don't like Fords, that wouldn't matter to them at all. But let's put all of our politics aside. If somebody offered you a free car, if you believed in the company and would be baptized in their pool, would you go, would you go do that? If it meant a free car. Well, what, has, what does a person have to do to get that new Ford? According to what it says up there by the advertisement, you can't just believe that, and that Ford is a good company and you get the car. And then you can go be baptized. You know, one could argue, I believe, give me the Ford and then I'll be baptized. Nope. It says if you'll 
believe in Ford and be baptized in our pool, you'll get the Ford. We understand that, don't we? In Acts 2.38, baptism is for remission of sins, friends. Baptism is to be saved in Mark 16.16. 16. It's for remission of sins in Acts 2. Then said he unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's salvation. So salvation comes when? When you're baptized for remission of your sins. And repent of your sins. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Repent and be baptized. Connective conjunction and tying two things of equal importance. All right. Now some people say, well, uh, that word therefore doesn't mean what, it, what you think it does. Well, it's the word ice, E-I-S, and it means in order to obtain. It does not mean because of. That's the Hebrew word or the Greek word gar, G-A-R. And there are two different words. There's several words for for in, in the Greek. But the Lord uses a specific one here when He says repent and be baptized in order or for remission of sins. In order to have remission of sins. He didn't say repent and be baptized because your sins are already remitted. That's dishonest exegesis of the passage. It's not what the passage says. See? So, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. In Matthew 26 verse 28, the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for the remission of sins. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Same expression in both the English and the Greek. 1 Peter 3.21 says baptism saves us. Peter said by the Spirit that the baptism saves us. The like figure wherein even baptism also now save us. And by the way, those that don't think that's water baptism, look at the example. Few therein, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure wherein even baptism doth also now save us. Not the washing of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You tie that with Romans chapter 6 and you see the parallel. We die to sin, we're buried in the waters of baptism, we're raised to walk a new life. And the blood of Christ saves us from our sins. Again, what happens sometimes, friends, and we have, I think we have a call about this right now, is some people think that, well, because the Bible says one thing saves us, and we brought it up, grace saves us, faith saves us, all that. I'm just going to take that passage and I'm going to ignore all the other ones. Well, you can't do that. You have to take all of what God says saves us. And all of these things save us. Bible faith is a work, friend, you know that? James says that faith and works are essential. But faith only is not something that somebody should believe. In 1 Peter 3.21, the like figure of baptism doth also now save us, not the washing of the filth of the flesh. Baptism now saves us. Baptism does not save us, which is true. Which are you willing to stand before God in judgment and believe and espouse and practice? Baptism doesn't save us, or baptism does save us now. 1 Peter 3.21 says it saves us now. Now you may think that it doesn't save us. It has nothing to do with salvation. But where's the passage? I've showed you one that says it saves us. Which statement do you believe? Well, looking at the evidence from the old to the new, the parallel in 1 Peter 3 is the old world, eight souls were saved by water, and they got to be involved in the new world, the world of the righteous people, those eight souls. All the other sin was gone, and the people that did it were gone. I get to say goodbye to my old life of sin. It's dead. It's gone. It's nothing going on. And, and I'm baptized for remission of my sins, and I'm brought forth a new creature in Christ, Romans 6. 
And I have a new life. I'm saved now. Baptism is the act that crosses, crosses you over into that. In Galatians 3, 26 and 27, we are baptized into Christ. Does anyone want to say that you can be baptized or you can be saved without Christ? I don't think anybody who's watching the program tonight or anyone in this area that believes in Christ would tell you you can be, you can be, you can be saved without Christ. Nobody believes, none, certainly nobody in this audience would believe that. So what does the Bible say we have to do to get into Christ? Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says what? We're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, verse 26. And if we stop there, we say, well, that's it, faith. But notice how that faith is expressed. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The completed act of being in Christ is only accomplished after you have been baptized. You're in Christ when you're baptized into Christ. All right, that's the evidence. As many have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We're what? We're baptized into Christ. And when we do that, we put Him on. We are in Christ. All right? You're children of God by faith. For, that denotes the reason that follows, you've been baptized into Christ. You are children of God by faith because you have obeyed by faith what God said to do and you've been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. Well, let's look in the New Testament and see what people in the New Testament did to be saved. This is the cases of conversion in the Bible. By the way, if you'd like a copy of this, please call in and we'll send you one. This is all the uh, conversions in the book of Acts of individuals that we know about, the Samaritans in Acts 8 verse 12. They believed and they were baptized. All right. The Jews in Acts chapter 2, they repented and were baptized. They believed, they repented and were baptized. Saul in Acts 22 verse 16, he was baptized. Cornelius, he believed, he repented and he was baptized. Lydia, she was baptized. The jailer, Acts 16, Acts, uh, he, he believed, he repented and he was baptized. The, Cor the Corinthians, Acts 18, they believed and they were baptized. All right. The Ethiopian eunuch, he believed, he confessed, and he was baptized. All right. Salvation, friends, is in Christ. He has redeemed us in him through his blood. We are redeemed in him through his blood. We're made near to Christ by His blood. We are reconciled into one body by the cross. The same blood that bought your pardon also bought the church. The blood is what saves us, friends, and it is achieved, it is found, it is received in the waters of baptism. We are baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27. We've read that before, 1 Corinthians 12.13, we quoted that. So salvation is in Christ. So why do we believe that baptism is essential to salvation? Because the evidence points to it. The objective standard says that it is essential to salvation. Objections come up, but they're not valid because they don't stand the test of coming up against the objective standard of the Bible. We are saved by faith. People said, <clears throat> If faith eliminates baptism, then it also eliminates repentance, and it also eliminates confession, and it eliminates grace. If you're just going to say you're saved by faith, and use that that we're saved by faith only, then it has to be only. You can't have baptism, you can't have repentance, and you can't have confession, or grace. All right? In James chapter 2 and verse 24 the Bible specifically says that faith only is a false doctrine. Show me your faith without your works, and I by my faith will show you my works. So then a man is saved by works and not by faith only. 
Now, he's not just saved by works either. He's not just saved by baptism. He's not just saved by confession. He's not just saved by the Lord providing a plan of grace. It has to be obedience, doesn't there? Choices made. So you see, you can't just have faith only without eliminating all the other passages that say that other things save us. Many who believed but were not saved. In John 8, verse 30, 31 and 44, but there are a lot of people that believed. In James chapter 2 and verse 19, the demons believe, but they're not saved. So you see, it takes more than faith. Jesus said, believe and be baptized. Not just believe, but be baptized. You know, we're saved by the blood. If the blood eliminates baptism, then it eliminates faith. If the blood eliminates baptism, it eliminates everything regarded as necessary by most people to be pleasing to God. The blood is the what. The baptism is the when. The blood is applied when we are baptized. And it's the operation of God. All right? We are washed in the blood of Christ when we are baptized for the remission of our sins. Acts 22 and verse 16. What happens when we're baptized? We wash away our sins. We have remission of sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. The blood does what? It cleanses us. It washes us from sin. The blood gives us remission of our sins. All right? Well, somebody will say, well, you know, the thief on the cross was saved without baptism. That thief on the cross has been through a lot of torture from people. The fact is, the thief on the cross lived in the Old Testament times. It's never said that the thief repented either, is, is it? Was the thief saved without repenting of being a thief? Think about that. The thief lived and died under the old law. Hebrews 9, 16, and 17, until the testator dies, the law is in force. The will is not in, in force until the testator dies. Okay? Jesus hadn't died yet. He's talking to the man. All right? So the old law is still under, under they're still under the old law. Now, what does Jesus command under the New Testament? Baptism. Mark 16, 16. The thief was saved in Luke 23 and verse 43. You'll be with me in paradise today. Now, there's a lot we don't know about the, the thief on the cross. We do know this, the man knew about, his king, about the Lord's kingdom. He knew a lot. Some have speculated that he was um, one of John's disciples, possibly a wayward one, because he knew about the kingdom. And he knew Jesus was innocent. All right? But the fact is, he was under Old Testament law. And Jesus could have saved anybody he wanted to at that time without violating Old Testament law. He was God. But what does the Lord say? We don't live under the Old Testament now. Christ has died. So baptism is commanded today. All right? Cornelius was a good man. He received the Spirit before he was baptized, but he wasn't saved. He had to be baptized. Holy Spirit fell upon, uh, as Peter began to speak, notice that. And uh, so in Peter's sermon, the Holy Spirit was given to them. And it, in Acts chapter, chapter 10, we find the Spirit was given to Cornelius and his household. All right. So notice here, in Mark 16, verses 19 through 21, there's a lot of uh, arguments that are brought up that Mark 16 is not in the text. Well, it's in the Vaticanus text, there's a lot of passages that aren't there. Okay? So you can discount the, the, the standard all you want to, but what does it come down to? Friends, we've talked a lot tonight about what it takes to be pleasing to God and why we do and we believe what we believe. And why we should be able to show what we believe from the Scripture. We think we've shown from the Scripture. Why you should be baptized, why church matters, why it matters what you believe. 
right? We've shown that from the scripture. Now, either you believe that or you don't, all right? And remember, our eternal destiny is based upon what the scripture says. Now, tonight, if you are not a true Christian, this is what the Bible tells you to do. Hear the Word of God, believe it with all of your heart, repent of your sins, confess Christ as your Savior, and be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. That's what the Bible says. And then live your life in all faithfulness until you die. Revelation 2.10b. So have you done this? If you haven't, call and we'll make sure that we get this taken care of tonight if you want to. You just let us know. If you'd like to study more about why you believe and give us the passages, give yourself back. Just prove to yourself. Maybe you'll find out as you go through the scriptures and trying to prove what you believe, you'll find out you're wrong. Call us. We'll be glad to help you to study God's Word. Don't take our Word. Take what the Bible says. That's our appeal. We thank you for tuning in tonight. We want you to know that you're welcome, and we invite you to attend our assemblies at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina, where the Newton Church of Christ meets. Our service times are at 9.30 for Bible study, 11 o'clock for worship, and at 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights. We want to thank you again for tuning in. The Word and Swords brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. You can contact us by email by going to contact at wordandsword.com. It's under construction. Also, you can contact us by phone at 828-465-3009, or you can just send us a letter by mail at P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. Do not put a check in that letter, okay? We don't want your money. We just want you to study the Bible, learn what to do, and then do it. Be pleasing to God and go to heaven. www.wordandsword.com is the website, under construction presently, but it'll be up and going for long. Tune in again on Tuesday, January 15th, 2019, folks. It's moving along at 8 p.m. as we continue to study God's Word. You have been very, very, very gracious to invite us into your home. I do apologize again for the coughing and the uh, disturbances that that caused. I'm uh, just getting over some congestion, as many of us are. But we thank you again for your time tonight and for tuning in. It does make a difference what you believe. It does make a difference what church you belong to. It does make a difference whether you've been obedient to the Lord in baptism or not. It does make a difference whether we're serving the Lord or whether we're not in the right way. We have a standard. Let's study it. Let's learn it. We'll be back in another two weeks to study more with you in your home. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight, and good evening.